السلام علیکم ہر آڈینس رب اشرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و حلل عبدہ ذمہ لسانی یفقہ قولی میں پاکستان یورو گائنی اسوسیشن کے پلیٹ فارم سے یہ پہلا ویبینار جو ہم لوگ کر رہے ہیں اس کے لیے آپ سب کو بہت ویلکم کہتے ہیں اینڈ وی فیل ریئلی بیکاز یہ ایک سر اچھا دن ہے چھٹی کا جس میں کہ آر اسپیکر دے ہیو اسپیئر ٹائم فار اس اینڈ دے آر گوئنگ ٹو شیئر دیئر ایکسپیرینسز تو ویبینار ہیز گاٹ اٹس تھیم لائک پریونشن ہم پریونشن پہ ہی بات کریں گے پریونشن سے ریلیٹڈ چار پریزنٹیشنس ہیں اینڈ وی ہیو گاٹ اے ویری لرنڈ اسپیکرز ود اس تو پاکستان یورو گائنی ایسوسیشن واز فارمڈ ان 2014 جب سے لے کے ہم نے کافی سمپوزیاز ورک شاپس اور سب کچھ کیے ہیں تو پریزیڈنٹ آف پیوگا ڈاکٹر پشپا پروفیسر پشپا سری چند بھی آج ہمارے ساتھ ہیں اور پروفیسر شیر شاہ سید جو کہ ہمارے سمجھ لیجیے کہ روح رواں اور بانی ہیں اور ڈاکٹر عزیز عبداللہ ہمارے بہت ہی آنری اور ڈیئر فرینڈ اور فسٹولا سرجن سز پاس ٹو تھاؤزینڈ سیون ہی از ایسوسیٹڈ ود پروفیسر شیر شاہ ان کوہی کوٹ تو میں ان کے بارے میں بھی آپ کو تھوڑا سا بتاؤں گی بعد میں جب ان کا سائٹیشن ہم کریں گے ان شاء اللہ لیکن اس وقت ہم پروگرام کو شروع کرتے ہیں اور میں اپنے پہلے اسپیکر کو انوائٹ کرتی ہوں پروفیسر عزیز عبداللہ صاحب کو اور یہ ہمارے پروفیسر ہیں ہیڈ آف ڈپارٹمنٹ آف یورالوجی ان لیاقت نیشنل ہاسپٹل اینڈ ہی از ایف آر سی ایس فرام آئرلینڈ ایڈمرا یورالوجی ماشاء اللہ انہوں نے بہت کچھ کیا ہوا ہے اینڈ ہی از ایسوسیٹیڈ ود کوہی کوٹ سنس پاس مینی ایئرس دو ہزار سات سے انہوں نے وہاں جوائن کیا اینڈ ڈاکٹر عزیز عبد اللہ از ویری ویری فیمس ان ڈوئنگ ہیز ریکنسٹرکٹیو سرجریز اور انہوں نے جتنے بھی ڈیفیکلٹ فیسٹیولاز ہیں اور سنڈیز کے دن جا کے کام کیا اور ماشاء اللہ ویری ایکٹیو سو وی آر آل ویری پراؤڈ آف ہیم پاکستان میں اس طرح کے نائس سرجنس اور ڈیڈیکیٹڈ لوگ ہیں تو وی ویلکم یو سر آج آپ نے ہمارے لیے ٹائم اسپیئر کیا اینڈ وی ووڈ لائک کہ آپ اپنی پریزنٹیشن اسٹارٹ کریں اینڈ دین وی ول موو آن فار دس تھینک یو ڈاکٹر شگفتہ فار کائنڈ ورڈس میری پریزنٹیشن مجھے بریف جو دیا گیا تھا وہ بیسکلی واز آن اوور ایکٹو بلڈ پوسٹ پیلوک سرجری Uh, when I going, was going through the literature, what I found, there was, there was seemed to be quite a lot of things that's happening post-pelvic surgery. Uh, um, not only the overactive bladder, but a lot of things are being uh, taking place. I think if you look at it, the uh, most common uh, pelvic operation is the hysterectomy that's been done worldwide. Uh, In the USA, more than uh, every one in three women under the age of 60 has undergone a hysterectomy. Uh, most of the time, hysterectomy has been performed for benign condition, an indication being to improve quality of life. And uh, uh, they're quite, uh, the complications are uh, not much uh, and has been associated with generally few complications. A uh, lot of studies have recently shown that they uh, seem to have a long-term adverse uh, effect uh, of hysterectomy on pelvic floor. A uh, long-term effect uh, uh, um, of pelvic floor is pelvic organ prolapse, uh, urinary incontinence, bowel dysfunction, uh, sexual function, uh, pelvic organ fistula. These outcomes are per uh, particularly relevant in life as life expectancy increases over a period of time and secondly may occur in long term uh, after surgical uh, procedure and may impair the quality of life. Uh, there's a number of studies that have been shown that uh, they have adverse effect of hysterectomy on pelvic floor uh, and also uh, uh, indirectly related to other health uh, aspects. The increase of stress urinary incontinence, uh, mostly 10 years after hysterectomy. Uh, as life expectancy has increased, the more women live uh, uh, after, uh, will live more of their life after menopause. Uh, pelvic floor dysfunction is, can be also related to age and post-menopausal uh, degenerative changes of pelvic floor uh, supportive tissue. 
consequently, large number of, of female will present with pelvic floor dysfunction, as urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse. And those patients who had underwent hysterectomy are more prone to these risks than as compared to um, those who do not have. Uh, rate of uh, hysterectomy differs between countries to country. Uh, also within the countries, uh, depending upon differences of mobility, uh, directly to the economic... Uh, uh, in USA, in, uh, around 600,000 operations are carried out annually, out of which one third of women have hysterectomy and are under the age of 60. Uh, in the UK, uh, one in five women undergoes hysterectomy. Uh, in developed world, uh, the rate of hysterectomy has declined over recent years, and which is attributed to uh, a use of alternate and less uh, invasive treatment option. Uh, the surprising thing or the marked thing that was found that the low educational status and income according to self has been associated with high incidence of hysterectomy that as compared to a educated and higher income group uh, patients. Uh, hysterectomy and pelvic floor disorder. Uh, uh, you can imagine hysterectomy is a risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence. It also associated with bowel dysfunction, pelvic organ fistula and sexual dysfunction. Uh, pelvic floor dysfunction uh, uh, generates substantial morbidity in elderly patients, uh, resulting in important cost to healthcare system, affect many domains of quality of life and daily functions. And severe dysfunction requires corrective surgery uh, and uh, more than 300,000 uh, for prolapse organ are performed annually. Uh, Population-based studies have shown the urinary incontinence ranging from anything from 25 to uh, 50 percent, uh, and uh, and this is one of the commonest reasons to uh, institutionalize the elderly patient because of the urinary incontinence in a developed world. Bowel dysfunction and constipation is a common problem affecting these uh, female patients also. What is the mechanism of uh, uh, pelvic organ disruptions before hysterectomy? Is because of the disruption of local nerve supply and distortion of pelvic anatomy, and also direct atrogenic injury to supportive structure, disruption of fascia and ligament, uh, which may distort pelvic organ uh, anatomy and subsequent hysterectomy. This also results from the change in uh, anatomical relationship between bowel, bladder, and vagina after surgery. Uh, alteration of pelvic organ function could be attributed to uh, functional dynamic anatomy and innovation of organ. Further to that is the decrease in uh, collateral blood supply to pelvic organ and surrounding tissue uh, may have a long-term effect on pelvic organ functions. There's a, a recognized risk of nerve damage during pelvic surgery. Uh, bilateral inferior hypogastric plexus provide both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation and is close proximity to proximal vagina and distal rectum. And it may be damaged during the hysterectomy and uh, um, in several areas at the division of the ligament while uh, blood and dissection of the bladder from uterus uh, dissection of paravaginal tissue at the level of cervix. Um, pelvic floor is also, and the urethra and anal sphincter is also innervated by distal branch of pudendal nerve, and which may cause disruption to them. And damage to them will cause a problem with the uh, continence mechanism and chronic uh, de denervation injury. And this eventually may uh, develop one of the causes of developing urinary or fecal incontinence. How does the bowel dysfunction take place? Uh, after hysterectomy, there's a change in rectal support and dynamics. Pelvic plexus may be uh, also damaged with uh, coordinate uh, contraction of smooth muscle, nerve conduction impairment, 
sharp and blunt dissection may interfere with in innovation and potential now uh, and part of maybe damage atrogenic injury to unit tract and bowel occurs during hysterectomy i'm not going to go into detail as dr pushpa will uh, deal with it in in, a, in her presentation um, in the western world or a developed world the incidence of unit tract injury or a rectal injury is reported as 4.3 percent but our own अच्छा आई थिंक के डॉक्टर अजीज अब्दुल्ला की तरफ कोई कनेक्टिविटी का इशू हो गया है सो आई वुड लाइक के डॉक्टर शगुफ्ता आप इस सेशन को थोड़ा सा कंटिन्यू कर लें जब तक डॉक्टर अजीज अगेन जॉइन अस कुछ लोगों को कनेक्शन में प्रॉब्लम हो रही है तो उनके लिए डायरेक्ट लिंक की बात कर रहे थे तो आप देखें अगर डायरेक्ट लिंक फेसबुक पे क्या नहीं है अगर है तो प्लीज डाल दें बिकॉज डिफरेंट लोग मुझे अप्रोच कर रहे हैं जैसे सिंह के वो कनेक्ट नहीं कर पा रहे ठीक है आपको अभी अभी एक लिंक जो है ना वो मैं ग्रुप पे डाल देता हूँ फेसबुक का ताकि लोग कनेक्ट कर लें वहाँ से डायरेक्टली शगफ्ता मेरा ख्याल है कि सेकंड प्रेजेंटेशन शुरू करवा दें कि लिमिटेशन ऑफ टाइम फिर अजीज अब्दुल्ला साहब को दे देंगे यू कैन स्टार्ट विद सेकंड प्रेजेंटेशन ओके लैपटॉप और समथिंग तो इस वजह से उनसे कनेक्टिविटी कुछ प्रॉब्लम हो गई अनफॉर्चुनेटली तो उनकी प्रेजेंटेशन इन बिटवीन है तो हम ये कर सकते हैं कि अपना टाइम स्पेयर करने के लिए मैं प्रोफेसर मैडम पुष्पा श्री चंद हमारी जो प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ प्यूगा हैं उनको इनवाइट करती ताकि वो इसमें आके अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन स्टार्ट कर लें और हम अपना टाइम स्पेयर कर सकें मैडम पुष्पा को सारे लोग जानते हैं मेरे ख्याल में वेल नोन पर्सनैलिटी है पाकिस्तान की और जो लोग भी हमारे जो members thing they are aware of her because she is a president she is a dean faculty sab kuch hai aur mashallah best teacher award bhi hasil kar chuki hai aur is waqt jo madam ki talk hai wo bhi bahut important hai prevention ke hawale se she is going to talk about the vvf madam because she is very much expert person in vvf doctor shesha ke sath hello uh, wapas aa gaya hu main aa gaye chale ha wo sorry kc ne saath nahi diya लाइट चली गई थी। ओके। आप कंटिन्यू करें। कंटिन्यू इन पाकिस्तान i think we got a fairly high number of cases uh, of atrogenic injury post um, uh, hysterectomy yes. i think uh, around the fistula work that we, we are doing at cui board around 80% of the cases nowadays we are doing is because of the atrogenic causes rather than uh, obstetrical causes uh, regarding pelvic organ prolapse uh pelvic organ is a major morbidity affecting 50% of the patient above 50 years of age uh etiology is multifactorial and several predisposing suggested uh, occupation that entail heavy lifting chronic constipation uh, connective tissue disorder genetic factor vaginal delivery multiparity advanced age obesity uh increase fetal weight and instrument de delivery uh in the us uh, incidence of uh, surgical correction is 1.3 per every 1000 patient women uh sexual function surprisingly there uh, there very little evidence in the literature that uh, suggests that uh, uh, the uh, sexual function is affected uh out because of hysterectomy but what has shown that it tend to improve one to two years after hysterectomy uh and it's been suggested that subtotal abdominal hysterectomy as a uh, provides better post operative sexual function cardiovascular diseases there's some evidence that shows that uh, following hysterectomy uh, there's a increased risk of cardiovascular diseases uh in swedish uh, study is shown that 
hysterectomy before age of 50 associated with a substantial increase in cardiovascular disease and later in life. A risk is consistent with both incidence of coronary heart disease and stroke. Uh, I think uh, this has been attributed to uh, early menopausal and probably risk factor for cardiovascular disease. O ovarian failure after hysterectomy may be the possible explanation uh, between uh, uh, hysterectomy and cardiovascular disease. Overactive bladder. I think uh, in this day and age, we are all very, very familiar with overactive bladder, uh, which is a syndrome consisting of uh, urgency, frequency, and nocturia, with or without uh, incontinence. It's a common entity and reasonably well treated with several anti muscarinic drugs, which are available for treatment. In addition, now for refractory OHB, we've got neuromodulation, botulinum toxin, uh, which part of the invasive, minimally invasive treatment. Yet there's a, a inverse condition that's very also important, but most of the time we tend to uh, ignore it or don't look for it. Uh, and that has been shown as in underactive bladder or UAB as opposed to OAB. Uh, the true sign um, underactivity or underactive bladder has been uh, um, uh, defined as a contraction of reduced strength and uh, in, and or duration resulting in prolonged bladder emptying and failure to achieve complete bladder emptying with normal maturation uh, and can be observed in many neurological uh, and myogenic failure conditions and myogenic failure. Uh, so far, uh, there's not much consensus for regarding a definition, sometimes called as underactivity, uh, incomplete emptying, neuropathic bladder. Uh, the true sign underactivity defined by international society is as contraction of reduced uh, strength uh, of, and of duration, resulting in prolonged or incomplete emptying of the bladder. Uh, so far, not much work has been done on that, uh, and a patient with underactive bladder has diminished sense of when bladder is full and, and not able to contract muscle sufficiently, resulting in incomplete empty. Causes uh, are wide and variant. Quite a number of causes, maybe a combination, maybe on its own. The most commonest causes of underactive bladder being a diabetic mellitus of what we call as diabetic cystopathy. Pelvic surgery is being attributed to underactive bladder, also pelvic and sacral play, uh, fracture, prolonged chronic bladder outlet obstruction, aging, neurological disorders, uh, multiple sclerosis, and wide variety of causes uh, from bladder injury to the spinal cord to herniated disc and golden barry syndrome, all are responsible for underactive bladder. Uh, the, what are the mechanism on the active bladder? Usually observed when falling mechanisms are damaged. Uh, bladder peripheral efferent pathways, efferent pathways, uh, lumbar sacral cord uh, injury or damage at the spinal maturation center, myogenic failure at the bladder level. Injury to pelvic plexus is uncommon and usually is atrogenic most often are happening after a major abdominal surgery and pelvic surgery, such as uh, radical hysterectomy and abdominal perineal section, where there's extensive mobilization uh, of the bladder and the pelvic floor dissection. How, we, how do we make a diagnosis? A patient on a suspected neurological injury should have, a, uh, should have a careful physical examination and should have a proper neurological examination to assess the sacral dermatomes, to assess perianal sensation, sphincter tone. Uh, um, history wise, they may complain of straining to maturate, incontinence, sensation of incomplete emptying. Unit history may be interrupted, disturb, uh, diminished and may have used abdominal straining. 
Sometimes this may be the only manifestation of some spinal cord injury like a cord uh, equina. Uh, and it uh, uh, requires a complex neurological evolution as is a varied and mixed symptomology. Uh, in case of uh, diabetes, uh, I think uh, we need to be on a lookout for this thing. And aerodynamics uh, uh, um, should be able to uh, show us with a long curve, with low lack of sensation, with empty bladder capacity, with low diffusive pressure. How do we can currently treat? Uh, so far, it's limited. There's no uh, validated effective oral drugs available. Commonest treatment option is uh, double voiding, straining to void and indwelling or intermittent self catheterization. Standard use has been uh, alpha adrenergic blocker to reduce outlet obstruction, uh, muscarinic agonist at betanacol, or choline esters inhibitors at diastigmine or neostigmine. Uh, however, this has shown a uh, few demonstrable benefit uh, with the addition of unfavorable side effect. Uh, what we have available at the moment, uh, as you can see, only thing that uh, we can so confirm is physiotherapy, double voiding, intermittent self catheterization. Drugs available are quite far and few, but None have shown, have shown them any potential benefits. Uh, prostaglandin E2 has shown some benefit, uh, but a lot of study still required. Stem cell therapy is promising that you inject uh, stem cell into the bladder wall to cause the, uh, for regeneration gene therapy. New thing that's promising is the herpes simplex virus encoding recumbent human nerve growth factor that's supposedly have some work. Uh, potential uh, treatment that are um, available or the candidate are uh, mesopestrol or colitis inhibitor, uh, but uh, a lot of side effects and benefits are not there. Uh, and presynaptic M2 receptor and again, uh, antagonist Prokinetics used in gastroenterology and smooth muscle anatropic are being in trial. Neuromodulation like sacromodulation, intervertical stimulation have shown some uh, benefit in limited number of patients. Use of stem cell regenerative medicine allows some degree of, and but still in trial phases. For my last slide, uh, regarding uh, conclusion, future perspective for women may, to make an informed uh, decision of whether to have a hysterectomy for benign gynecologic conditions. In, information and immediate outcome of surgery as well as risk of developing disorder later in life should be made available. Adverse long-term outcome of hysterectomy may include pelvic organ prolapse, urinary incontinence, incontinence, bowel dysfunction, pelvic organ prolapse, and uh, there's been associated malignancy like renal cell carcinoma. There's a statistical uh, uh, show, but not direct evidence has been shown. In future, I think counseling on advantages and disadvantages of various modes of hysterectomy can be weighed against alternate treatment. Uh, epidemiological uh, study may pave the way for individualized treatment of women on the woman predisposing factor, heritable age, medical history, and environmental exposure. Absolute number of women affected by late secular hysterectomy are relatively low, but unfortunately not in Pakistan. I think we're seeing more and more of immediate effect of hysterectomy. Also, later on presenting with uh, pelvic organ prolapse and other effect with blood, uh, bowel and bladder dysfunction. Impact of these late complications are, all, are often life-changing. And considering the num immense number of hysterectomy performed every year, potential risk for uh, long-term effect in aging population must be uh, may have an important implication for women's health worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.
thank you very much, sir. Uh, in fact, Aapne, uh, what you discussed was the prevention and the management of the overactive bladder after having the pelvic surgery. Uh, this is a very important um, topic. We'll have some discussion on it later on when we'll go after the presentations. That would be the uh, discussion among, among the panelists. So I would like to invite the next speaker, Professor Pushpa Sirikan. She is uh, the professor uh, president of the Pakistan Urogyne Association, and she is going to talk about the vesicovaginal fistula. Is it a, a major morbidity and how we can prevent it? So for that purpose, Madam, uh, she has done a lot of job, like uh, fistula she has repaired in many years, she is doing that. So I would like her, I would like to give her the mic so that she should start her presentation. Thank you. Going to say about fistula is, what is an obstetrical urogenital fist? Demographic features of fistula patients, and then to know the pathophysiology of fistula, and to know the impact of fistula and quality of life. How can we prevent it? And if time permits, I can give you a few tips about the trick presentation up to prevention. Well. Uh, Urogenital fistula uh, as every little tract and uh, urinary leakage. And the commonest type of fistula among the urogenital fistula we see is a vesicovaginal fistula. Okay. Uh, and the, you can see this is there is a big fistula which is communicating between the bladder and the vagina. And this is an obstetrical fistula. Well, how much is the burden of the disease? Each year, we see about half a million women. They die from complications of pregnancy and childbirth. Obstructive labor is about 6% of all maternal death. It is responsible. And for every maternal death, 10 to 15% of women, they suffer from serious complications. And one of the worst complications, I will say, is a vesicovaginal fistula. Well, it's not a new story. The evidence has been found in one of the mummies around 2050 BC. And the fistula has been described in 10,030 by a very famous Arabic physician, Ali Ibn Sina, in his book, al Kanun. So this is a very old story and the misery of a woman which she, which she is being suffered. Globally, about more than 2 million women they remain untreated with the fistula. 50 to 100,000 women, new cases they occur each year. So see how much is the prevalence and the burden of fistula patients. The tragic story is that more than 80% of these women who are suffering from vesicovaginal fistula, they are from developing countries, mainly Asia and Africa. What is the scenario in Pakistan? In each, each, occur each is the burden of patients in Pakistan. 4,000 to 5,000 cases they occur each year. And I think more than that, because these are the patients who come to the hospitals. But there are many patients who never come for a treatment. The most common cause of obstetric fistula, it is obstructed labor. But I must add here that now we are receiving more and more patients after gynecological surgeries, and the commonest gynecological surgery is hysterectomy. So very rightly said by Professor Aziz Abdullah that we should think before, this, before making a decision about hysterectomy in a woman with a benign gynecological condition. There should be a valid indication. And we should think that whether a doctor who is performing hysterectomy on a woman will be able to carry out this procedure safely. And the third is 
that he should predict the complications which he or she might be facing while carrying out his trectomy. And then the other thing is that he must, if he is a male surgeon, he is going to perform a hysterectomy on her. He should properly learn the procedure. And then at least a pelvic examination should be performed by a female gynecologist to rule out any pathology in the cervix. Recently, I received many patients where hysterectomy is performed for heavy vaginal bleeding. And when I did a pelvic examination, it was a case of advanced carcinoma of cervix because one, no one performed the pelvic examination prior to hysterectomy. They went to a male surgeon, male surgeon removed the upper part of the uterus and left behind the cervix. So these are the things which can lead to a iatrogenic fistula and uh, leading a life of a woman miserable. Uh, what are the common causes for obstetrical fistula? One of them is a malnutrition. You can see this young girl, this young girl, she got married at age of 16, had a first baby at 17. She had a caesarean hysterectomy for a ruptured uterus. And then she was divorced by her husband and she was brought to me by her uh, her uh, father. You can see short stretcher, obstructed labor, ended up in a uterine rupture and hysterectomy. Another factor is early marriages. Look, look at this young girl. Sixteen years old. Got married at fifteen. First child at sixteen. Still born baby, she developed VVF, RVF. And the risk factor is a multiparity. Because of multiparity, you can see there can be deficiency of calcium, and that leads to the sagging of joints, and the sacral promontory comes forward, reducing the anteroposterior diameter of pelvic inlet, leading to a obstructive labor. And in another, uh, another reason for obstetric labor in a multiparous woman is that with each successive pregnancy, there is increase in the size of the baby, and that leads to an obstetric labor. Aksar sasen bolti hain, ji, humne to das peche ghar pe peda kar liye, to aapko kuch nahi hona. But this is wrong. Even obstetric labor can occur in a grand multiparous woman. Then majority, more than 75% of deliveries, they are conducted by unskilled birth attendants, which results in uh, obstructive labor, stillborn baby, and vesicovaginal fistula. You can see a woman, she is dribbling every drop of urine. She is making and passing every drop of urine. And the end result is, they are completely isolated women. And then coming to three delays, which are very popular delays. One of them is delay in the decision making because majority of the decisions, they are made by males. And uh, when they start laboring, the male may not be present at home. He may be away and by the time he comes and take her, to hospital, she is in a full-blown obstructive labor. Then delay in transportation. This may be the only transportation which is available to her. And then another problem, which is really a, a very heartening problem, heartbreaking problem, is that once they reach to a hospital, Marmarakar hospital be punch gain, then there is a delay because in hospital particularly the government hospitals, there is a long waiting list. And by the time they are carried to a theater, their uterus and bladder ruptures, and end result is fistula formation. Well, in an obstetric labor, the pathophysiology is that 
Anteriorly, the uterus is sandwiched between the symphysis pubis and the skull bones, and posteriorly, the bladder it is compressed between the fetal skull bones and the sacral promontory, leading to a necrosis and later sloughing, resulting in a vesicovaginal and rectovaginal fistula, and they leak both urine and feces. Physical morbidity, you can see uh, malnutrition. Uh, I always show, like to show this uh, woman in my presentation. Uh, she developed fistula about 35 years ago. Small mid-vaginal obstetrical fistula, very easy to repair. But no one brought her to hospital. And the, by the time she was brought to hospital, what happened to her? She had edema because of malnutrition. She had pulmonary tuberculosis. And uh, when, while she was being investigated, next day after admission, she, she died, most probably because of uh, pulmonary embolism, because she was bedridden for so many years and she was mobilized. The embolus was dislodged. Another uh, morbidity is extensive excoriation. The urine, all the time, it comes in contact with the skin, leads to uh, excoriation which is really a well, not only from vesicovaginal fistula as an obstructed labor, but they also suffer from four degree perennial tears leading to fecal incontinence and rectovaginal, both rectovaginal and vesicovaginal fistula. Well, look at this picture. Uh, here, this patient was brought to us within 24 hours after delivery. And you can see the baby has delivered through the perineum. And of course, later on, she will develop fecal and urinary incontinence. Well, another morbidity which they suffer, they are the bladder and vesical calcula. And this calculus, a big calculus within the vagina and the bladder, and that was removed with obstetrical forceps. Uh, they also suffer the skeletal abnormalities, walking difficulties because of the leg pain, reduced mobility of <laughs> joints, foot drop due to nerve injury and contractures. All these, they end up in walking difficulties. Well, they may be completely aperonia. They develop aperonia as a result of fibrotic rings within the vagina. Well, uh, looking at this picture, the other morbidity is uh, depressive illness. And uh, they are, you can see all they are depressed. And these are the uh, pictures of same ladies after successful repair. There are many reasons why they undergo depression. And uh, well, uh, what our, uh, I want to tell you what are our challenges. Uh, we must find out the hidden cases of obstetrical fistula. Here you can see the patient was brought by her son. She developed fistula when this son was born and she came to us when, uh, after 35 years of her fistula. Prevention of fistula, how can you prevent it? Well, this is absolutely a preventive uh, condition and this prevention can be at a primary, secondary and tertiary level. Coming to a primary prevention, Promotion of breastfeeding, well, it has been said and it has been seen 
that the girls they are breastfeeded only for 11 months and the boys are breastfeeded for complete 2 years this is wrong there should be no gender uh, discrimination in breastfeeding their babies immunization if we give a proper immunization the girls they can be prevented from infection which can prevent their growth and the proper nutrition should be given to a girl child so that their pelvis they can grow properly we must stop early marriages if we none of the marriages should be done before age 18 because by that time their pelvis is fully developed and they can deliver vaginally then provide them good after once they conceive they should be provided good obstetrical care and that we can only achieve this goal by training the midwives and the community health workers because these are the only persons who go at a community level and they uh, come in contact with the community and they, they are the backbone who can prevent this drastic complication of vesico vaginal fistula then better transportation facilities by better communication and better transport so that they can be timely trans, uh, transported to a healthcare facility and then secondary prevention if we maintain a partogram for every laboring patient we can diagnose obstructive labor very early and then provision of cesarean section facilities at door steps primary referral centers tertiary prevention creating the awareness up to uh, about fistula by talking at every forum we must talk about the fistula only then we can we can create an awareness we can arrange seminars we can arrange talks we can arrange uh, conferences to and at every forum we must be talking about fistula we should arrange workshops we have been arranging workshops on uh, uh, safe hysterectomies and how can we pre- prevent injury at time of performing hysterectomy both vaginal and abdominal hysterectomies so i think my time is over uh, and uh, i cannot go to uh, uh, dr tahira can you permit me to go for management or we should i must stop here dr tahira yes yes i'm here uh, dr you... yes if, if time you... permits if time permits i can continue or i can stop here uh madam it's 50 i think more than the normal time more than the required you can take 5 minutes more 5 minutes more okay thank you so much thank you so much okay the immediate management is that if you find a small fistula retain the catheter at least for 3 weeks and uh, then the time interval between a large fistula obstetrical fistula and repair should be 3 months root of surgery i will say that vaginal is the best uh, it carries a less morbidity in comparison to abdominal and we must follow the basic principles that is a uh, extended trendelen park position with a steep head down tilt that br- that brings the bottom of the patient about 6 inches below the table gives an you an exposure to a fistula and then uh, good exposure good hemostasis and tension free closure these are the basic principles of uh, fistula and if there are big fistulas the orifice is very near to to the fistula tract then we must retain the catheters and that can be placed through a vaginal route easily then i must stop here because because of the time constraints i am ending my presentation i am thankful to 
the guest pharma and uh, to dr shagufta tahir for arranging this program and thankful to everyone dr aziz abdullah dr chesha dr nasi everyone so they have really cooperated with us and we are i am really thankful to everyone who who is uh, who, who has come for this program and his spare time thank you so much thank you very much madam for your enlightening presentation i hope uh, this may have given a lot of uh, learning points to the audience now i would like to invite colonel nazli hamid she is our next speaker and she is executive member of the pakistan urogyne association and she is associated with us since very beginning and today uh, and she is having her uh, more um, uh, sub speciality working in urogynecology as well as in the assisted uh, reproductive techniques now today she is going to tell us about uh, the uh, covid related to the covid the problems how she said how much an obgyn uh, so the guidelines of the management of the urogyne patient during the covid uh, pandemic so she is going to talk about it today and we would like to invite colonel professor nazli hamid and she is going to talk about this topic right now thank you mic to nazli thank you very much uh, madam pushpa sirishan uh, president pakistan urogynecology association for a kind uh, words that she said and thank you very much dr shugufta for arranging this uh, lovely webinar um, i was mainly uh, concerned to to talk about uh, the guide the latest guidelines that we have got about management of a urogynecological patient uh, during uh, covid 19 pandemic utilizing telemedicine so uh, this this is basically taken from uh, a latest meta analysis which which um, examined and reviewed the existing evidence about how these patients should be managed so uh, what they did was that uh, the family uh, the the female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery uh regarding that they searched the, this group the ones who published this uh, article you know a couple of months ago they they searched all the literature and tried to find out the evidence based guidelines for women who are suffering from uh, uh, disorders related to female pelvic medicine or pelvic reconstructive surgery and because the because of time constraints you know they they mainly went to explore the past literature and guidelines Uh, primarily to see whether there is something existing you know in beforehand regarding the use of telemedicine in urogyne patients and then uh, in those patients where the existing literature was not enough they tried to uh, practice uh, the, the telemedicine uh, in a way to minimize the patient contact to reduce viral spread and for those topics where the literature was inadequate they got expert consensus guidelines Uh, to help uh, the consultants who are taking care of these patients so mainly the systematic review methodology was uh, utilized to evaluate these conditions to uh, use telemedicine in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery pessary management urinary tract infections and in patients with urinary retention so for these four disorders uh, they got a sufficient literature in the past on which they could conduct a systematic review and present certain guidelines then uh, these are four, uh, another group of four disorders on which they just found some some past systematic reviews national or in society guidelines and, and these were urinary incontinence vaginal utero vaginal prolapse fecal incontinence and defecatory dysfunction and these four categories are those where they did not find any systematic analysis or any national or international guidelines from any country and they uh, tried to gather pooled clinical experience and expertise to reach consensus from the best clinical practitioner in the field uh, and these included uh, management of female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery in the virtual setting scenarios requiring in person visits symptoms which should alert providers to covid infection and special considerations for management of patients who are no have covid-19 disease so for virtual visits virtual visits are uh, are obviously the best because they bring the patient uh, a satisfaction level to the patient and and also to the provider and patients uh, 
who are remote from the care or who have other barriers to in-person care, they, they would be the ones who will be most satisfied by having virtual visits because this is the second best replacement of in-person visit. So like Madam said, you know, those patients who are in, in the remote areas and uh, if for those patients, if virtual visits can be arranged, that would be at least helpful, um, you know, in, in these categories of patients. And there are many online and society endorsed resources available to supplement patient counseling in a virtual setting. For pessary management, patients can safely extend the interval for inpatient, in-person pessary care up to six months. So here the main stress was that where the pessary management is concerned, the emphasis should be on teaching the patient herself how to take out, how to wash the pessary and how to replace it instead of the patient traveling all the way to an inpatient setting or an outpatient setting in a hospital to reduce the COVID-19 exposure. And patients could be encouraged to self-clean and self-remove or replace the pessary. And post-women menopausal women can be encouraged to use a vaginal estrogen to facilitate uh, an appropriate vaginal health to reduce uh, injury to the vagina during the self-removal and self-replacement process. Then uh, urinary tract infections, where they said that the women have classical symptoms of dysuria in those category of patients without any uh, further waiting, empirical antibiotic therapy should be started. And this empirical antibiotic therapy should be in alignment with Infectious Disease Society of America, IDSA, and European Society for Microbiology and Infectious Disease, ESMID. So, Empirical therapy where classical features of frequency, urgency, dysuria, and or hematuria are present, empirical antibiotic therapy should be started. And telemedicine visits can be utilized to, access, to assess the patient risk factors for antibiotic resistance or systemic illness. For example, if the patient is diabetic or if the patient is immunocompromised due to some other reason, those features can be digged out on telemedicine visits. And antibiotic stewardship, while important, is less of a priority during a pandemic. This was the, the conclusion. And patients who have got signs and symptoms of bacteremia or upper urinary tract infections, they were the patients who were, you know, considered mandatory to be brought to an inpatient status, uh, to, a, to an inpatient setting or an outpatient setting in a hospital for in-person visits. So where upper urinary tract infection is suspected or, or bacteremia is suspected, there the patients should not be treated on telemedicine visits. For chronic urinary retention, which is defined as post-void post residual urine of more than 300 ml for more than six months, it does put the patient at risk of upper urinary tract infections. So in these patients, techniques like Professor Abdullah just said that double voiding Voluntary pelvic floor re relaxation and credit maneuver, they are the ones which should be adopted. And those patients who have got new onset of urinary retention symptoms and fail outpatient management strategies, they should be offered clean intermittent self catheterization, which is definitely preferable to a long term indwelling catheter. In those conditions where we uh, have, like, we have repaired the bladder post operatively, and we consider that this patient needs a post operative urinary retention or indwelling catheterization for like two to three weeks, she should be instructed how to remove the catheter safely at home seven to 14 days without any need to have an office visit. And antibiotic prophylaxis, according to them, should not be routinely used in women who need long-term catheterization. In patients with urinary incontinence, recommended conservative management procedures such as pelvic muscle training, dietary triggers, Voiding training and medications are the first line treatment as always. And patients which have formerly received the third line treatments may revert back to first line or second line during COVID-19 pandemic to avoid an in-person office visit. So normally when a person fails, you know, a first line or second line treatment, the we move forward. But here they have made an exception that even if a patient has gone to third line treatment, just to, uh, you know, pass over this difficult time we can revert back to first line and second line to get at least some improvement in quality of life rather than exposing the patient to a COVID-19 pandemic. And smartphone applications are also available for pelvic floor muscle exercises. For pelvic organ prolapse, they have con what they have concluded is that because this uh, condition advances very slowly and generally it takes uh, you know, many years and most of the times even decades, so this is not an emergency. So behavioral modifications such as weight loss, 
cessation of smoking or hookah smoking and pelvic floor exercises should be taught on telemedicine clinics and placing a large tampon or splinting with voiding or bowel movements are simple strategies which patients can perform at home to relieve the symptoms. For example, if a patient has rectal seal and she has difficulty in passing stools, she can be taught the techniques of splinting, uh, which otherwise we do not encourage, but in this uh, pandemic situation, they've accepted it as a, as a valid treatment strategy. So uh, defecatory dysfunction or fecal incontinence, uh, here, they have generally encouraged the use of uh, soluble fibers to solidify the stools uh, if there is incontinence and osmotic or stimulant laxatives in, in those cases where there is constipation. Bowel schedules, tap water enemas, glycerin suppositories, you know, these are the common things which we do use. They can be reliably used to evacuate rectum and avoid bowel accidents. And similar, uh, simpler um, maneuvers like changes in changing in the postures by elevating the legs or splinting during bowel movements, as I already said, can be encouraged. Food triggers which cause fecal urgency and incontinence can be identified on food diaries. You know, so we have learned a lot about bladder diaries, but you know, in this time, for the first time, I've come across this term that food diaries can also be maintained to monitor the patient who have got fecal incontinence and those foods which trigger those episodes should be avoided. And then uh, those patients who have got a specific COVID-19 scenario, what are those situations? So those patients where evidence of severe or urgent post-operative complications are present, they should be evaluated in the office regardless of COVID-19 uh, uh, situation. Or patients who have got acute worsening of incontinence due to cough and upper respiratory uh, symptoms or acute worsening in fecal incontinence, they should be screened for COVID-19 signs or symptoms if, they are just if we are just suspecting uh, them on the basis of symptoms. They should undergo a triage screen followed by antibody testing. And if that antibody testing is positive, they should be subjected to a PCR testing. And surgeons should discuss the unique risk of nosocomial COVID-19 infection during the consent process for elective or urgent surgical treatment. So these are the patients where we think that something urgent needs to be done. The informed consent should include the presence of COVID-19 infection in these patients and, and the risk, additional risk which the presence of these comorbidity could invite in those patients. And patients who have got suspected COVID-19 infection should be referred for appropriate testing and precautions should be taken. So I conclude, uh, this, this was their final concluding, concluding slide where they said that they have got uh, uh, the, uh, this literature review and the strengths of this literature was that, that it, uh, a trained team reviewed the existing literature and a, an extensive and a very thorough systematic review was performed but the limitation of the study obviously include, included that it was a rapid methodology and there was a lock, lack of prospective data uh, which, could answer, which could have answered many pertinent questions in this setting. And um, as far as future progress is concerned, as, uh, as the epidemic evolves and our learning about the COVID-19 infection presentations and management of other disease processes is concerned, that improves, we are hopeful that our understanding of managing urogynecological patients during this COVID-19 pandemic will also improve to decrease unnecessary exposure of the patients by reducing unnecessary hospital visits. I thank you all. This is uh, mainly the reference uh, from where I, I took this, uh, these guidelines uh, for future you know, if reference. I thank you all. Um, if there are any questions or comments, I am available. Uh, so then, <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Nazmi. In fact, uh, this was a very uh, timely said or work ki zarurat guidelines hai, re related to the Eurogyne, jo recent updates hai, wo aapne di. That's nice. Uh, we really learned a, lo uh, a lot of it. But unfortunately, your screen share not share. So, slides log not dekh sakte. So, this was something difficult. But the question answer session would be in the end. So after your talk and all talks are finished, then we will invite you again. Please stay with us. Now, the next speaker I would like to invite Professor uh, Shersha Sayyid Shay. He is the executive member, founding member of Pakistan Urogyne Association. 
आंसर हैज ज्वाइंड अस फ्रॉम यूएसए बिकॉज़ हमारे ये नेशनल और इंटरनेशनल स्पीकर हैं एंड सर इज गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द हाउ मच अ ओबीजीवाइन पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट शुड नो अबाउट द यूरोगानाकोलॉजी यकीनन यूरोगानाकोलॉजी इज अ न्यू सब्जेक्ट और इनपुट सर के आप बहुत ज्यादा जरूरी है एंड सिंस आर सर ही वाज थोड़ा सा इनके बारे में बता देती हूं पास्ट प्रेसिडेंट रहे हैं एसओजीपी के और करंटली ही इज द फिस्टुला के जो प्रेसिडेंट ही सिलेक्टेड एन इंटरनेशनल फिस्टुला ऑर्गेनाइजेशन के ये प्रेसिडेंट सिलेक्ट हुए हैं और ही इज सिलेक्टेड इन 2019 फॉर द टू इयर्स और ये सर का विजन और वर्क बहुत है इन फिस्टुला नंबर 1 नंबर 2 इज अ मिडवाइफरी सर्विसेज ऑल ओवर पाकिस्तान ही एंड ही इज ही हैज रिटन 15 बुक्स और स्पेशल बात ये है कि वो किताबें उर्दू में लिखी गई हैं ताकि वो मिडवाइफरी सर्विसेज जो हैं वो डेवलप हो सकें तो वी वुड लाइक टू वेलकम सर बिकॉज़ आप हमारे साथ हैं चाहे आप इंग्लैंड अमेरिका में हो चाहे आप पाकिस्तान में हो हम आपको बुला लेते हैं और वी वुड लाइक टू गिव यू द माइक अब आप इस पे बात कीजिए और बताइए कि हमारे पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट्स को क्या क्या सीखना चाहिए यूरो बैंक में थैंक यू सच डॉक्टर पुष्पा फॉर गिविंग मी दिस चांस टू टॉक अबाउट दिस इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक इन फैक्ट जस्ट थ्री वीक्स अगो आई वाज सिटिंग विद डॉक्टर अजीज अब्दुल्ला एंड नुजत फारूकी एंड वी वर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ फिस्टुला we were having in <clears throat> koi goat hospital and we all agreed that we should organize a two or three days workshop with uh, nuzar tajiz abdullah and pushpa uh, <clears throat> to discuss how much a postgraduate students in obgyi should know about urology and <clears throat> we came to some conclusion and that's are that uh, what kind of fistula we receive obstetrical fistula and fistula after uh, after episiotomy fistula because of the lower segment cesarean section fistula after dnc fistula as as is mentioned and uh, madam pushpa mentioned after hysterectomy and i know few fistulas which aziz has repaired after appendectomy and the operations surgical operation by the surgical surgeons because of the uh, obstruction so this this kind of fistula we receive and uh, as far as obgyi people are concerned uh, during their training they have they don't have enough exposure to urology to deal this kind of thing so we thought, we thought that a obgyi pg should know about the very detailed anatomy of the pelvis everything in the pelvis the candidate should know its anatomy in detail then the physiology of these organs in the female pelvis and then the pathophysiology of these organs which uh, dr aziz abdullah and push Doctor Pushpa mentioned very nicely. They should know about all all this, and how how they will know about it. Unfortunately, uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, they have uh, either they have no understanding or they don't understand that how much uh, obstetrician and gynecologists should do urology because of this new policy of the elective. Majority of the uh, PG students are doing. Uh, some posting in pathology some posting in ultrasound uh, instead of doing some good things in uh, surgical ward medical ward and urology ward because i always thought that obstetrician before they appear in part 2 exam they should work very hard in in the department of uh, medicine uh, dealing with the medical patients from cva cva uh, to typhoid then they should spend some time in urology at least 6 months so this is the uh, this should be the recommendation for uh, for uh, cpsp but i think it is very difficult to convince uh, people uh, who can make change in cpsp to do something about it i know dr pushpa and other people who have recommended these things many time but uh, uh, nobody hears Uh, because uh, this may be not their uh, priority then i thought and uh, dr azizullah and nusrat both agreed 
that uh, every uh, candidate during their training should know the basic technique of clinical medicine from history to investigation. It is a very routine practice. I see people come to my clinic and the gynecologists, they have seen them and the first thing they do, go and do the pelvic ultrasonic examination. They don't take a detailed history. They do not examine the patient from top to toe and then the pelvic assessment, make a provisional diagnosis, then think about investigation. You even may not to do an ultrasonic examination just by uh, palpation, you will find something uh, and you can, you can give the treatment. So I thought the, this skill of taking history and making a diagnosis, doing uh, examination from general examination to uh, palpitation and percussion, these basic things which we learned during our training in, in, in UK that is lacking in Pakistan. Uh, it, it is the weakness of supervisors and the supervisors, they don't have a time. They are very busy in their uh, duties in government hospital and private practice. And then the number of uh, candidates are too many for one supervisor. And at the same time, again, I will blame CPSP. There are, there are many places where... Oh, awesome. yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There are, there are many, many, many places where uh, there, there can be supervisors, but because of the red tapism, uh, those, those people are not supervisors. Anyway, so this thing should, be, uh, should, should, should happen. The second thing is that every uh, gynae postgraduate student should be able to do cystoscopy. And cystoscopy is not a rocket science. And uh, as, uh, as I, I know that uh, during uh, his visit to Koyigot Hospital, I'm very thankful to Aziz Abdullah that all of the doctors working in Koyigot Hospital can do cystoscopy because of the uh, uh, great effort of Aziz Abdullah and his team to continue this training in the postgraduate uh, uh, students. So when then they are able to do uh, cystoscopy, then they are not dependent on very basic things to urologists and things are just stopped because uh, uh, the urologists are not avail available. Something I want to talk about is episiotomy. We receive a lot of patients with the fourth degree tear and uh, instinctor problems. And thanks to Aziz Abdullah, that everyone in Koyigot Hospital, including me, I think Dr. Zidul is one of the best person who is doing the best instinctor repair. So we learned from him, and I, I and he used the technique of Dr. Kess of uh, uh, Nigeria. And why we have so many uh, instinctor problems? Because our 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 postgraduate students, they don't learn the basic technique of managing second stage of labor, then the episiotomy. When, do, when they do episiotomy, they often damage instinctor because they are not aware of the basic anatomy of the pelvis. That's the reason I mentioned in the very, very beginning. They should, in their training, they should know the anatomy and physiology of the pelvic floor. And the, and, and the problem caused by this uh, episiotomy. I remember one patient which I shared with Dr. Abdullah, that patient suffered for at least 18 months because of the bad episiotomy and multiple repairs of that sphincter inspector and her whole life become horrible. But anyway, in the end, she was fine. So uh, some of the time, diagnostic curidage and that in that cases uh, some of the gynecologists cause uh, fistula which is very difficult to make this fistula but again this 
is because they are unaware of the basic uh, anatomy of, of the cervix and the uterus and the and the vagina and how to dilate and how to use your curator and you should not be able to cause this uh, utero vesical fistula or sometime cervical vesical fistula because of the uh, use of uh, a curator so these are the basic things i think we a uh, uh, postgraduate students in obgy should know i will just repeat again in in brief so if it is possible for dr pushpa and others to convince cpsp to do these kind of things then maybe uh, this kind of morbidity will decrease so again a detailed knowledge of pelvic uh, anatomy and physiology six months at least in uh, urology six months in medical ward and a very good teaching as far as clinical skill is concerned forget about the uh, ultrasound and ct scan and mri majority of our patients are very poor they can't afford it anyway so a big uh, number of problem will be solved if our uh, postgraduate students and gynecologists are able to take basic history detail examination and then make a diagnosis then go for, for the investigation which is required so these are the basic recommendation uh, from me and let's have some discussion on this thank you thank you very much dr uh, shersha i think now uh, the host uh, as we change i heard this thing anyway this is this was the uh, second last talk the last uh, is my topic i am going to talk about the prevention and the prediction of the how we can prevent the pelvic floor dysfunction and uh, i uh, just introduce myself i am dr shubhuta tahir and i work for the pakistan urogynecology association and this is uh, the webinar we are uh, doing it for the learning and training of the pelvic floor dysfunction we are talking about right now so my presentation if they show me uh, can we predict and prevent the pelvic floor dysfunction this is my today's topic of discussion so next please uh, next please. now for the introduction of the pelvic floor dysfunction i'll say rather this is a global problem and it's affecting the hundreds of the millions of the women throughout the world so prevalence of one form of any of the pelvic floor dysfunction including the urinary incontinence fecal incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse may be there in 46% of the people lifetime risk of having the surgery for the pelvic organ prolapse is between the 5 to 19% this is something next the pelvic floor dysfunction it's a major issue health issue of for the women and we must take care of it and for that purpose we need to identify the women who are at risk the key element of the prevention strategies one of the major barrier is on our side that we cannot find out we uh, this is our inability to effectively identify the women who is at risk of developing the pelvic floor dysfunction later in the life so next please so a little bit about the etiology the etiology of the pelvic floor dysfunction is multifactorial and it is mostly affected by the obstetrical trauma and and all of us we know that in a third world country where the birth is unattended and it is conducted by the thighs and in peripheral areas at home and multiple children they are being born and there is a multi parity lot of the problems associated with it so these are the risk factors and the risk factors what they identify was obesity in other than family history aging aging like after the menopause the woman is going to have any um, pelvic floor dysfunction like urinary incontinence is very frequent and fecal incontinence high parity multi parity as i said so after the child birth of the or even the first child on if somebody has produced only one child they have also increased incidence of having the, uh, the pelvic floor dysfunction later in their life now uh, the question arises question is this whether this increase is due to the pregnancy per se or it is related to the child birth 
carrying a baby for the nine months in the abdomen. It is a continuously pressure from above down. As we know, this is the gravity pull from below as well. The pelvic floor, it is made up of the anal uh, levator and eye muscle, which is simple a muscle, simple sheet, and it is covered with the fascia. It's sort of more, you know, it can be pulled down. Or it may be because of the childbirth, which is the pushing or the mode of the delivery. These questions, they need to be answered. And for that purpose, we need to conduct the research. And as you know, we are randomized controlled trial to evaluate the causal effect of the vaginal and the cesarean birth on the future pelvic floor dysfunction have not been performed up till now because of the lack of the feasibility. So we need to rely on to the objective pathophysiological data and the epidemiological data. This is to evaluate the effects of the vaginal delivery on the pelvic floor. Then we can see the effect of the vaginal delivery. The difficult vaginal delivery, including the force of vaginal delivery, it is associated with the bad effects on the pelvic floor. Number one. Number two, if somebody is pushing against the undilated service, prolonged second stage of the labor, and if somebody is having a big size of the babies who are being pushed and a difficult delivery, in fact. So all of these above risk factors, they are associated with the stretching, compression, and the ischemia of the pelvic floor muscles and the nerves, which later on leads towards the dysfunction. Next, please. So clinical evidence we can gather by the ultrasound. It is a special modality. If we perform the ultrasound of the pelvic floor, MRI and electrophysiological techniques, they can be utilized to find out this problem. Mr. Delancey, he's reported uh, occurrence of the levator and eye damage following the spontaneous vaginal delivery is six to 10%. But after the first of delivery, this was very much higher, about 60 to 70% he observed the people have the damage to the pelvic floor. So we can say ultrasound can detect this. Ultrasound is a very good modality and it is a cheap as compared to the MRI. And it, the study was conducted by Mr. Dates and they reported that the detachment of the levator and eye muscles from its attachment into the pelvic um, uh, uh, bones, it was present in 14 patients out of 39 women. And when they were examined after the vaginal delivery, and they were associated, they were having the problem like they had the urinary stress, in, stress urinary incontinence after the birth of the baby, three months, just 12 weeks after the delivery. So a study was conducted, that is Epicon study. And this demonstrated that 1.7 fold increase, there's a risk of having the urinary incontinence after one or more vaginal delivery as compared to cesarean section. And that is related to the age because of the aging process is going on. If somebody doesn't have any problem like a normal vaginal delivery, but still they have high chance of having the urinary incontinence in later life. So age standardized prevalence rate of UI is 15.9% for the cesarean section group, and it is 21% for the vaginal delivery group. And the other studies which are related, they also indicated that increased risk of the urinary incontinence, pelvic floor uh, prolapse, and following the vaginal delivery is higher as compared to the uh, cesarean section group. Then another study which was the, done by the Swedish Swedish pregnancy, obesity, and pelvic floor. These are the three risk factors. They took pregnancy, obesity, and pelvic floor dysfunction. And this was named as three pop study. And this was designed for the specific aim of comparing the prevalence of the pelvic floor dysfunction after the 20 years of the last delivery by the vaginal delivery or either by the cesarean section in a cohort of a woman. So this study assessed the prevalence and risk factors for the UI, urinary incontinence, pelvic floor organ prolapse that may be symptomatic later on or maybe the fecal incontinence of women after the 20 years of having one delivery by the vaginal delivery or maybe that delivery is by the cesarean section. Then another study, uh, according to this sweep up study, they said increased risk of developing the urethary incontinence was seen about 67% after the vaginal delivery as compared to the cesarean section. This is with the adjusted odds and there was no difference of having the urinary incontinence later in the life if the cesarean section was performed in emergency, whether it was done with the elective cesarean section. Prolonged stages of the labor, it creates difference with the um, vaginal delivery. That was 2 to 20 percent, there was an increase in the pelvic organ prolapse. Then pelvic organ prolapse 
it was increased with the BMI when it is high. It is associated with the obesity. Every 100 grams of the fetal weight increases the risk of having the pelvic floor dysfunction later in the life. So that is related with the big size of the baby. As we see in the multi-parity, the baby size increases with the age and with the number of the children when they are increased. Then another study. Sorry, I cannot control my this. Next, please. So another study, which was the prolonged study, it was a longitudinal study of pelvic floor dysfunction and childbirth. And the, according to this study, which was conducted by the three universities, University of Birmingham and Aberdeen and Otago, what they did, they took the deliveries of the 12 months from 1993, April 1994. And the, uh, about 7,883 women, they participated. And three months after the index birth, they assessed those patients. And 3,638 women, they were followed up for the 12 years after the delivery of that baby. And then they found, next please. Then they found there were the certain very important uh, findings that the partial protection of urinary incontinence was noticed after the 12 years of the vaginal delivery uh, by the cesarean section. That was less. It was 40% in the cesarean section as compared to the vaginal delivery, which was more. It was 55%. Sweep up study, it was for 20 years after the childbirth. And they found the 40% there was increased risk of having a uh, problem. And 40% uh, with the vaginal delivery and cesarean section was 29%. But there is no evidence of having redu of reduced fecal incontinence after the 12 years in both of the studies. But the risk of the long-term fecal incontinence was significantly higher after having one or more of the instrumented deliveries. So cesarean section gives the partial protection for urinary incontinence. Prolonged study, again, this gives us one very important finding, which was the risk of the fecal incontinence is significantly higher with the forceps delivery. And there's no increased risk is seen with the vacuum. So vacuum delivery is safer as compared to the forceps delivery. If we have to select any of the instrument for uh, performing the assisted vaginal delivery, so we must select the vacuum as compared to the forceps, which is having more damage to the pelvic floor. So that is best option for the prevention of the pelvic floor dysfunction later in the life. So twofold increased risk of the third and fourth degree perennial tear is seen with the forceps delivery if it is not done by an experienced person and it is not given a good support to the anal, uh, to the episiotomy. So twofold increase of the levator and I evolution with the forceps as compared to the vacuum. So vacuum is safer as compared to the forceps. So currently main prevention strategies, what we can opt, cesarean section, and other mode of deliveries, yes, we can think on it. Pelvic floor muscle training, this is very important. Then modifiable risk factors and lifestyle interventions. These are the things we can, I'll talk about it. Next, please. Now, what are the modifiable risk factors of the lifestyle intervention, which can prevent the urinary incontinence later in the life? So the women should not smoke before and during the pregnancy. Level two, B, grade B, but this is very important. Uh, in Pakistan, the people, they take tobacco. <coughs> we can tell them that they, they, they should not take during pregnancy. So women should aim at the normal weight to start with the pregnancy and later on with the pregnancy. Her, uh, her BMI must not be uh, overweight or the obesity. Aim at regaining the pre-pregnancy weight postpartum should be the uh, aiming of the patient. So we must tell the women that she should breastfeed Every uh, month, they will lose a two kg of the uh, body weight as if they will be feeding to the baby. So lactation, it's very important uh, uh, instrument we can tell our patients so they, that save the baby as well as to the mother. Occasionally, low intensity training, it should be advocated. Like they should have the in, training of the pelvic floor. Constipation should be avoided during the pregnancy and postpartum. And next, please. So constipation, we know this is only one uh, factor which can lead later on with the formation of the rectal prolapse and, uh, and then, like we can see the posterior vaginal wall descent. Now, can we protect and prevent the pelvic floor dysfunction? Now, this is again the question. So what is it? Now, we can say informed choice to the patient. It 
given or not. Based on the result of the prolonged CPOP and other studies, the hypothesis was your, your choice has been put forward based on to the available data, scientific evidence, and the features of the mother and the baby. They can be scored and used to determine the most suitable route of the delivery to avoid the future pelvic floor dysfunction. Now we can say that the woman, if she is going to give a birth to one or two children and her age is more than 35 as we, in our part of the world because the girls, they are getting married in the late ages. And uh, sometimes they are the people, the women, they are very posh to posh, they cannot. So we can have a choice for them. Okay, uh, if, if they are having some complication, they can think for the uh, elective cesarean section for the delivery to prevent the pelvic floor dysfunction later in the life. So U, is, uh, U stands for the presence or absence of the antenatal urinary incontinence. If the person is not having any complication or having antenatal problem, you can think for that. Race, ethnicity of some people, childbearing started at what age? Height of the mother. If she has a short stature height, having a pelvic deformity or problem. So she may go into the obstructed labor and later on fistula and a lot of the complications. So she can be given the choice of having a cesarean section. Overweight mother who is having a BMI, which is more than 30 or 35. So that lady, she needs uh, to be counseled. Inheritance, we can say like in a family history, if somebody is having already, the mother is having a fecal incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse because of the weak uh, collagens, genetic predisposition, or having a job description like that, they can have a more chance of having a pelvic organ prolapse in later in life. So we can give a chance that they can think on it. Children, if they are not desiring the child, to, uh, children more than two or three, as we know, the families, they are uh, now reducing in the science. They are not having more than five, six, seven children. So we can give them the options. So the estimated fetal body weight is very important factor. As I said earlier, every 100 grams of the weight of the baby increases, that leads to the, the complication in the pelvic floor in the, and the difficult birth, after the difficult birth. Next, please. So we can conclude like the women is increasingly involved in the decision making process everywhere. After the individual risk assessment and counseling, they can be much easier regarding the mode of the delivery. As we are involving them for the decision making, we can tell them that regarding the complications, what they can get after the complicated vaginal delivery. The mode of delivery we can decide according to the patient's complication and the fetal problems. The trend is clear in developed world. The woman is older and the bearing of first baby, first baby and the baby uh, is in, later in the life. And the babies are heavier in some way and the maternal BMI is usually more. So UN data suggested that the total fertility rate in the world over is decreased. It's less than two children per family. So we can discuss these issues with the women if we find that they have got a problem. So if they opt for it. So cesarean section offers a protection from the urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse and the fecal incontinence later in the life. Ingrid Negard, he, he raised the question that should the women be offered the elective cesarean section in hope of preserving the pelvic floor dysfunction later on? But we know that the cesarean section cannot be performed on all of the women. So there are documented potential risks with the operative delivery and having a lot of the problems. So what should be done? So our recommendation is the predictive model which estimate the individual risk, they can be used to make the informed decision by the patient and the healthcare provider to prevent the pelvic floor dysfunction later in life. And the lady can choose the most suitable mode of the delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for kind listening. Now this is the time for the uh, panel discussion. Uh, if we have some questions, from the audience, love to have all of them. Speakers are with or, us. Or, or, any, or anyone. Uh, this, uh, 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 the speakers, uh, I was the last one. So if, if there are some questions we can ask. One question I have uh, to ask from doctor, what is it? Shabin now she asked that we want, she want to know the uh, population data of Pakistan. She doesn't want to know about the Swedish one. 
तो she said that we will love to have the evidence prevalence in our population as compared to the Swedish one and with whom we have almost no match. So this is Dr. Shabinas. She asked one question from audience. Dr. Shabin, Pakistan ka data to kuch bhi nahi milta hai yaar. Pakistan mein kisar data hai? Lekin, lekin ye ke jo jo keh rahe hain Dr. Aziz. उससे ये अंदाजा किया जा सकता है कि अगर वहां होता है तो शायद यहाँ भी होता होगा कितना होता होगा ये तो मेरे ख्याल में आ, किसी को नहीं पता होगा क्या ख्याल है लेकिन यहाँ राइट लेफ्ट सेंटर हिस्ट्रेक्टमीज हो रही है जरूरत भी नहीं है जिन कंडीशंस के लिए उनके लिए भी हिस्ट्रेक्टमी हो रही है बास पेशेंट हमारे पास ऐसे आते हैं जो स्ट्रेस एंड कॉन्फिडेंस के साथ आ रहे हैं उनका ये क्या है ट्रीटमेंट क्या हुआ है उनकी एबडामी कर दी गई डेटा और यहाँ उसके बाद उन मरीजों को कुछ पूछता नहीं उसके बाद फिस्टुला बनता है तो वो महीना महीना दो दो महीने तक उनको जो एंटीबायोटिक एंटीबायोटिक देते रहते हैं कि इससे बंद और फिस्टुला रिपेयर हो जाएगा ये डॉक्टर बुलवा ने भी देखा होगा आपने भी ऐसे मरीज देखे होंगे जिनमें ये इशूज आ रहे होते हैं उसके बाद उन मरीज की ओनरशिप भी नहीं होती कि हाँ बाबा फिस्टुला बन गया है उन्हें काउंसलिंग करें बताए वो सब कुछ नहीं हो रहा डेटा तो कोई जमा कर ही नहीं रहा है इस मुल्क में मैं मैं एक चीज शेयर करूं आप लोगों से अभी अभी कुछ महीने पहले मुझे कांटेक्ट किया था यहाँ पर नेपालीज डॉक्टर्स एसोसिएशन ऑफ अमेरिका ने और उन्होंने उन, उन, उन्होंने एक सवाल डाला था वो ये था कि नेपाल में एक एनजीओ ऐसी औरतों की हिस्ट्रक्टमी के पैसे दे रही थी तकरीबन तीन सौ डॉलर डॉक्टर को मिल रहे थे जो कि पहाड़ों पर रहती है जिनके प्रोलेप्स यूट्रस है तो बेचारी प्रोलेप्स यूट्रस का तो खैर हिस्ट्रक्टमी हो गई लेकिन कुछ नेपाली डॉक्टरों ने ऐसे लोगों का भी हिस्ट्रक्टमी कर दिया जिनको कोई जरूरत नहीं थी और सिर्फ उन पैसों की खातिर तो नेपाली गवर्नमेंट क्योंकि सेंसिटिव गवर्नमेंट है शरीफ लोग हैं सोचते हैं अपने आवाम के बारे में तो वहां पर बैन लग गया और नो बडी कैन डू हिस्ट्रक्टमी विदाउट कंसल्टेशन ऑफ एटलीस्ट टू टू थ्री गानाकोलॉजिस्ट तो ये बात बिल्कुल अजीज साहब की सही है कि हमने भी देखा है कि बहुत से लोगों की हिस्ट्रक्टमी इस वजह से कर दी जाती है कि उनका स्ट्रेस एंड कॉन्फिडेंस कंट्रोल नहीं हो रहा है और ये बात मेरे लिए बिल्कुल नहीं थी थैंक यू डॉक्टर अजीज के हिस्ट्रक्टमी से रिलेटेड इंक्रीज इंसिडेंस है कार्डिक डिजीज की ये मुझे नहीं, नहीं पता था तो ये एक बड़ी दिलचस्प बात है और हमें भी देखना चाहिए कि किस पेशेंट की जरूरत है कि नहीं है एक डॉक्टर शबीन अगर क्वेश्चन बहुत अच्छा है हाँ एक इनपुट में देना चाह रही थी सर कि बिकॉज हिस्ट्रैक्टमी करने से प्रोलैप्स के लिए मसला हल नहीं होता है बिकॉज प्रोलैप्स में तो पेल्विक फ्लोर डिसेंट होके नीचे आ गया यूट्रस तो बेनाइन है बल्कि यूट्रस तो एक प्लग है जो कि पेल्विक फ्लोर को प्रोटेक्ट कर रहा है अगर वो खुद बीचा नीचे आ गया है तो उसका मतलब है इट नीड्स द सपोर्ट सो वन ऑफ द क्वेश्चन एक सवाल मेरे पास है डॉक्टर बुशरा फिर दोस्त बुशरा ने भेजा है डिलीवर्ड थ्री ईयर्स बैक नॉट शी प्रेजेंटेड विद थर्ड डिग्री प्रोलैप्स and she said ke uska kya kiya jaye management for a reproductive uh, age can 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 i reply can i reply shagrata bilkul aap bolte hain main batata hu ji uh, she must be she is in a young lady she uh-huh. is a young lady in a reproductive age and yes. uh, she has delivered her last baby about 3 uh, months back 3 months back 3 years 3 years 3 years, years back uh-huh. because she is in a young lady so the nowadays uh we offer pessaries to every patient as a first line treatment bilkul sahi and particularly in uh, young patients pessary yes. is a first line treatment and if he she is not satisfied with the pessary if pessary fails then i will think about the sacrohistopexy but the first line treatment in this young lady is pessary yes yes acha aur baad dafa aisa bhi hota hai ke is in patients ka kuch skin or biopsy karna chahiye kyunki baaz patient mein congenitally absence of neurons hote hain ek ek condition hai aur ye young ladkiyon ko is tarah ka prolapse ho jata hai unke management kafi mushkil ho jata hai क्वेश्चन 
Sir, if there is a strong positive, agar if uh, there is a st- again, uh, Dr. Shesha, I agree with you that you should take a proper history prior to make a decision what type of uh, treatment is best suitable for that particular patient. We should take a history. Say, if a patient has a hi- positive family history of prolapse, uh, either in a nulli paris woman or a woman of uh, low parity, that means uh, she has uh, congenital connective tissue disorder. That's Bilkul, why her, uh, her uterus has prolapse. So Bilkul. the management actually starts with the history, and if the history suggests then she needs a mesh repair in a form of sacrocalpopexy, Otherwise, sacrohistropexy, otherwise it will not work. One question, madam. If the girls, they are asking. They say, uh, if we find a small tear in a posterior vaginal wall during the delivery, but gut is not involved, you know, so should we repair at that time? Well, it depends if there is a, sm- there is a small tear in a posterior vaginal phonics. If it is actively bleeding, it should be repaired. If it is not actively bleeding, there is no need to repair it. So, if if if, if it's there, then they can repair it. So we have seen. Yes. That Act- is- if it is actively bleeding, it should be repaired. If it is a small tear, not actively bleeding, don't apply sutures because too many sutures applied can lead to a vaginal stenosis. Dyspyronia and aparonia. Vaginal fistula as well. You know, if they apply it, yeah. they can get the rectal vaginal fistula later on. Yes. Uh, I made mean, one question from uh, uh, Dr. Aziz Abdullah. He was uh, saying that um, uh, the stem cell uh, we can implant in a bladder who is having the uh, like uh, overactive bladder, and it is not under control. Is this yeah, underactive? A... Underactive bladder. Underactive. 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 Under active bladder में trials हो रही हैं कि जब stem cells को bladder में वो करने की ताकि regeneration के लिए और ये trial उसमें भी हो रहे हैं sphincter के जो pelvic floor में भी stem cells को inject कर रहे हैं to regenerate for stress urinary incontinence under active over active bladder में इसका कोई role नहीं है ये सब experimental है अभी कोई इतना इसकी study हो रही है आप दर बताएंगे इसका mode of action क्या है कैसे होता है ये किसका ये स्टेम सेल जब देते हैं मेरी जालत को मेरा माफ कर दीजिएगा लेकिन ये कैसे ब्लडर में जब देंगे तो क्या करेगा ये नहीं ब्लडर में जो उसकी जो इंटरनल ब्लडर मसल्स में दिया जाता है ताकि बेसिकली देखिए जो अंडर एक्टिव ब्लडर हो रहा है वो नर्व की डिजेनरेशन हो रही है मोस्ट कॉमन जो है वो डायबिटिक में होता है डायबिटिक में न्यूरोपैथी होती है डायबिटिक सिस्टोपैथी होती है कि मसल डिजेनरेशन होती है और नर्व्स की डिजेनरेशन हो रही होती है तो उसमें वो इंजेक्ट करके ऑन प्रेजम्पन के वो आप नर्व सेल्स और ग्रोथ सेल्स दे रहे हैं वो इंजेक्ट कर रहे हैं स्टेम सेल तो उनकी रीजनरेशन करेगा रीजनरेशन तो ये है कि वो इंटेंसिक उसका जो मेकेनिज्म है ब्लैडर का जो अपना जो है मिचुरेशन का सेंटर जो बनता है जो वो रेगुलेट होगा और वो बेहतर होगा ये सब बाद पेशेंट में इम्प्रूवमेंट आई है बाद में नहीं आई है तो अभी स्टिल वेरी एक्सपेरिमेंटल स्टेज है लेकिन एक नई चीज है दे वर्किंग टूवर्ड दैट अब लॉन्ग टर्म क्या रिजल्ट होते हैं तो वक्त ही बताएगा तो पोस्ट ऑपरेटिवली डॉक्टर अजीज ये ओवर एक्टिव ब्लैडर ज्यादा कॉमन आपको मिला या अंडर एक्टिव अंडर एक्टिव ज्यादा ओवर एक्टिव इनिशियली होता है जो जिसमें आप मोबिलाईज कर लें प्रोलॉन्ग कैपिटाइजेशन कर लें लेकिन अगर आपका डायसेक्शन बड़ा है काफी एक्सटेंसिव डायसेक्शन किया हुआ है तो उसमें मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम ये होता है कि अंडर एक्टिव ब्लैडर मिलता है अच्छे खासे मरीज जो है आपकी जैसे प्रोलॉन्ग लेबर है या उसके बाद भी आते हैं तो जो आपने भी देखा होगा सबने कि वॉइड नहीं करते हैं उनको कैथेटर डाल के छोड़ना पड़ता है कि न्यूरोप्रेक्सिया हो रहा होता है इसी तरह अगर सर्जरी जो है जिसमें रेडिकल हिस्ट्रेक्टमी है या ए पी है उसमें ये पैरा ये डैमेज होता है रिटेक्शन ऑफ यूरिन के साथ प्रेजेंट करते हैं ओवरफ्लो इन कॉन्टिन्यू करेंगे तो उसमें दो चीजें आपने देखती हैं इधर तो यूरिथरी स्ट्रक्चर या 
वो भी वो भी प्रॉब्लम हो सकता है दूसरा हमारा ब्लैडर है तो सर इसके लिए बेस्ट ऑप्शन ये है कि वो दे शुड दे शुड रेफर द पेशेंट फॉर दी सिस्टोग्राम उसके लिए बेस्ट तो यही हिस्ट्री एग्जामिनेशन होता है उसका कैरेक्टराइज करें बाद दफा मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम जो होता है इतना अगर डैमेज नहीं है तो रिकवर कर जाता है नहीं है तो नेक्स्ट स्टेप तो यूरोडायनेमिक टेस्टिंग है उसकी के देखने के लिए कि ब्लड है क्या क्या बोल रही है सर आपने देखा बेथनिकोल हाउ मच इट इज इफेक्टिव फॉर द अंडर एक्टिव ब्लैडर लिटरेचर तो जो कहता है कि डज नॉट वर्क देखिए इसका डज देखिए ये इसका मोड ऑफ एक्शन क्या है एगेंस्ट है ये ये ब्लड टोन बढ़ाएगा सिंपैथेटिक पैरासिंपैथेटिक इफेक्ट आएगा लेकिन hmm. उसका जो डोज आपको इतना ज्यादा देना पड़ेगा कि उसके सिस्टमिक साइड इफेक्ट हो okay. जिस डोज में हम इस्तेमाल करते हैं उसमें तो उसे उसका कोई वो इम्प्रूवमेंट नहीं आती है hmm. लेकिन अनफॉर्चुनेटली हम भी देते हैं hmm. लेकिन फॉर से कुछ देने को हो hmm. लेकिन व्हाट आई पर्सनली फील और मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम इट डज नॉट वर्क वॉट वर्क कि आपको उसको पेशेंट को कैपिटाइज रखते हैं कुछ दिन के लिए उसके साथ दे रहे होते हैं तो ब्लैडर टोन वापस आती है ब्लैडर को रेस्ट मिलता है तो उसकी जो न्यूरल इंजरीज हुई भी होती है ब्लैडर की बिकॉज ऑफ डिस्टेंशन वो रिकवर करती हैं तो अराउंड सिक्सटी सेवेंटी परसेंट पेशेंट जो है वो न्यूरोप्रेक्सिया से रिकवर करते हैं एंड दे स्टार्ट वॉइडिंग अगर नहीं होता है तो सेल्फ कैथराइजेशन दैट दिंग अवेलेबल That is one of the issue. So, इसके लिए हमें यूरोडायनामिक इशू है सर दूसरा आपने बताया था कि द बेस्ट ऑप्शन ये है कि जो सर्जरी है मतलब वेन इट इज रिक्वायर्ड ओनली इट शुड बी डन यानी अननेसेसरी पहले में जो स्ट्रेक्टमीज है ये सब कुछ दे कैन लीड टू लेटर ऑन ये तो ये तो ये तो बेसिक बात है ना जनरल सर्जरी में अगर आपने काम किया हुआ हो तो जो पुराने जनरल सर्जन थे उनका हमेशा ये 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 बात करते थे कि सर्जन को ये पता होना चाहिए कि उसने कब सर्जरी नहीं करनी है जिस तरह मैं प्रोफेसर ब्लैंडी की सेइंग है कि लेट द पेशेंट अर्न हिज और हर ऑपरेशन बिल्कुल इसके ऊपर बात जरूर करें कि कहाँ सर्जरी नहीं करनी क्योंकि सर्जरी करने पे तो सब बहुत ज्यादा इंसिस्ट करते हैं बट देर आर सर्टन प्लेसेस जहाँ सर्जरी वर्क नहीं करती कहा दवा right. नहीं देनी है कहा सर्जरी नहीं करनी है yes. कहा सेक्शन नहीं करना है कहा रुक जाना है ये सब और, और, और हिस्ट्री लेनी है ये सब बात है ये तो होता ही नहीं आजकल आजकल पेशेंट आया पेशेंट जो हुआ हुआ होता है अभी एक अनमेरिड बच्ची 19 इयर्स की मेरे पास कल आई जिसके रिकरेंट यू टी हालांकि कोई पब्लिक ऐसा नहीं कि वो पब्लिक टॉयलेट्स बहुत ज्यादा यूज करती है उस तरह से और उस रिकरेंट यू के बाद उसको वो मतलब यूरिनरी ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन हो जाती है फिर उसको हर दफा कैथराइज करना पड़ता है वन लीटर टू टू लीटर तक उसका ब्लैडर डिस्टेंड हो जाता है इतना रिटेन और फिर मैंने उसकी जब सिस्टोस्कोपी की तो देर वॉज क्योंकि ब्रीकरेंट यू टी आई की हिस्ट्री थी बीच में हिमाचूरिया की भी हिस्ट्री थी तो आई डेड असिस्टोस्कोपी के कोई फोकल लियन तो नहीं है तो देर वॉज नो फोकल लियन बट देर वॉज खास तौर पर ट्राइगोन के रीजन में इट वॉज नॉट टिपिकल ऑफ इंटरस्टिशियल सिस्टाइटिस वैसा ग्लोमेरल पैटर्न नहीं था लेकिन देर वॉज एन हाइपर जैसे इन्फ्लेमेशन सारी थी और सो इस तरह के पेशेंट को आप क्या करें यानी वो एंटीबायोटिक्स तो पहले ही बहुत सारी लेकर वो आ चुकी है और बहुत सारी यानी ऑलमोस्ट सारी एंटीबायोटिक्स ऑलरेडी एग्जॉस्ट कर चुकी है सोलिफिन क्या और ये क्या जेनरिन फोर्ट क्या इस तरह के पेशेंट में अनमेरिड बच्ची है आप एक लिमिटेड सी सारा इंटरवेंशन कर सकते हैं तो वॉट इज योर सजेशन इन सच अ पेशेंट डॉक्टर जी इसको क्वेश्चन है देखिए इसमें बेसिकली तो इशू ये है किन क्या है मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम होता है जो एंटीबायोटिक दो दिन खाई तीन दिन खाई उसके बाद छोड़ दी उसके बाद प्रॉपर एंटीबायोटिक नहीं मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम जो एंटीबायोटिक दी जा रही होती है उससे ऑर्गेनिज्म रेजिस्टेंट आ रहा है अब लाहौर का पता है कराची के जो हम एंटीमायोग्राम जो देख रहे हैं उसमें ज्यादातर जो कोलिफॉर्म इन्फेक्शन है वो मेजोरिटी नाइन्टी जो है वो किनोलॉल से रेजिस्टेंट आ रहे हैं 
अच्छा क्योंकि लोकल ईस्ट्रोजन कम्बाइंड विद एस एस आर आई इनसे बहुत अच्छे इनके रिजल्ट सबसे पहले तुमने वहां से स्टार्ट किया था फिर उसके बाद अच्छा चीजें शुरू हुई बट उसमें से यस और हमने इंट्राविजाइकल हेपरनाइज सोल्यूशन उसको दी बट वी डिड नॉट गिव हर इंट्राविजाइकल डायजीपाम और इंट्राविजाइकल स्टीर ऑयल्स अब अब क्योंकि यू नो आई आई एग्जॉस्टेड ऑल माय अदर ऑप्शंस आई डेफिनेटली कैन स्टिल दिस आई थिंक कैथरीन शी गेव दिस एंड डॉक्टर साकिब ही आस्क मी ही हैड वन ऑफ द पेशेंट वाज हैविंग इंट्रेक्टेबल पेल्विक पेन तो उन्होंने मुझे फोन किया भाई शुगुफ्ता वो कौन सी दवाई थी जो उन्होंने बताई थी so diazepam 5 mg in a vagina is she said ke 8 hourly or 6 hourly do teen din ke liye leke dekhe ya one week ke liye and that may be vagina yeah this was a really different uh, treatment you can ask her as well catherine is still there to jo na usne hi hame recommend ki thi for the pain of the pelvic pain as yes, you can ask her. so that is a good option yeah so we are uh, i am any anything uh, you want to share our speakers but these speakers they are with us and i really thank you all of you uh, we had a very good uh, session uh, interactive but um, any question anything you want to share from your side to aap baat kare us pe because we are going to i think finish our time 5 to baj rahe to speakers if you thank want you, to say thank something. you very much uh, thank you dr pushpa Thank you. Thank, you so thank, you uh, thank, you thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pushpa. Thank you, Dr. Pushpa. Thank you. Thank you for sparing your precious time. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Puga, I thank every one of you for spending your precious time. Thank you so much. Much better. I'm thankful to um, Madam Pushpa Sirica. and professor sherja and dr aziz abdullah and professor nazli hamid they joined us from uh, various uh, cities and today we are um, uh, together for a webinar session inshallah we would like to have another uh, conference in uh,